Good evening. I'm Mick Brown. Uh, I'm a writer for the Daily Telegraph, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Telegraph subscribers to this very special event where we're pleased to welcome two giants of the world of thriller writing, Karen Slaughter and Lee Child. Uh, before I begin, uh, there's a little housekeeping, apparently, which I have to deal with. Um, for the audience at home, you can make the video full screen by clicking on the square on the bottom right. Uh, for this event, questions have actually been submitted to me in advance, but please do email extra at telegraph.co.uk if you have any difficulties, as colleagues are on hand, apparently, to help you, which is good news. Um, it's the convention on such, such occasions to say someone needs no introduction, so I'll keep it as brief as I can. Uh, I'm assuming you've both read Karen and Lee's work. Uh, if you have, you'll know how both put the thrill in thrillers. If you haven't read them, why not? Because you're in for a treat when you do. Both have new books uh, that we're here to discuss, After That Night by Karen and No Plan B by Lee and his brother Andrew, and which approach the thriller genre from very different directions, but pack the same impact and the same commercial heft. It's vulgar perhaps to talk about book sales, but indulge me for a moment. Together, the books of Karen Slaughter and Lee Child have sold more than 140 million copies, which apparently outstrips JK Rowling and Tolkien. Uh, and so far as I can make out is exceeded only by Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities and The Little Prince. Uh, they were written a long, long time ago. So presumably you're gonna catch up very, very quickly on, on both of those. Um, I gather you're both friends as well as co-habituates of the front table of Waterstones in every bookshop in the world. Can you tell us a little about your friendship? How did that begin? Gosh, I mean, I think I was, I had started a little ahead of Karen, I think. And uh, so I was finding my feet while she was making her debut. And I'm not sure, I can't remember the exact first time that we met, but I remember the first significant thing, which was that Karen was doing an anthology that was called Like a Charm. And it was based on the idea that there was a charm bracelet that had picked up charms along the, over many, uh, over a century, really, you know, one episode after another. And uh, somebody dropped out. And so Karen called me on the phone and said, uh, would, I, would I contribute? You know, would I fill this gap? And she explained the concept and she said, the charm bracelet needs to start out in a certain place and then end up at the end of my story in a different place. And uh, it was quite a tight specification and quite, I, I thought, difficult. So the whole time she was talking to me, I was rehearsing my apologies and thinking, you know, what should I say to, uh, to turn it down? But then in an instant, I suddenly saw how to do it. And so on a dime, I switched from, from saying no to saying, sure, I can do that. When do you need it? And she said, oh, I need it in about two days. Um, yeah. And I said, all right, but you're going to owe me a beer. And the very next day by FedEx, uh, a six pack of Budweiser showed up. And I thought this <laughs> one is a keeper. Right. <laughs> so what made you, what made you, ask, you, you got him. What, what made you uh, reach out to Lee like that? Well, you know, when Lee's first book came out, it was set in Georgia and I was not yet published and I was writing in Georgia. And my first response was, you know, who is this asshole writing in Georgia? Georgia belongs to me. Um, and I read the first novel and, you know, I was like, damn, now, you know, he owns this. And I was really annoyed because I didn't realize that he had set up this beautiful idea for Reacher to move around. And so I assumed mm. it was going to be set in Georgia. And I, I saved a little bit until I read the description of the new one. And I was like, oh, thank God. So this is <laughs> this guy could be my friend now. Uh, so it just showed you my arrogance thinking I was going to own an entire state. Um, but right. I. You know, when I first met him, he just charmed the socks off me. He's a really engaging, fun guy and no bullshit, which is really important, particularly in the business we're in. And 
someone did drop out and he was the first one I had thought of. And I didn't think he'd do it because he, you know, is, was so busy, still so busy at the time. There's a lot of demands on him. And I felt you were really generous. But I will say it's illegal in America to ship beer to yeah. a friend. And so I remember standing I in the um, line at the FedEx and I've got this six pack wrapped up in a box and I'm shaking and I'm thinking this is going to explode because I'm shaking it so hard. So I literally <laughs> risked my life and my future uh, to give that to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure you're it. It, it was it's illegal in New York to ship alcohol and i was sure it was going to be in georgia also so uh, that is why i was really impressed by it. i thought yeah this this woman will not take no for an answer and uh and that's kind of the story of her career you know yeah uh, I, I i the first book came out and i became a a huge huge fan and uh, i still totally am and that's really the first thing that I, I wanted to say about this book you know they sent me after that night as the advanced ed edition, which is not really the same as, as what the published book will be. That's the back of it actually, because it's a sort of teaser before that night, after that mm -hmm. night. And so I get this book and it's a Karen Slaughter crime novel. Therefore, clearly it's gonna be honest, tough, unflinching uh it'll be about a serious crime this is not the a body in the library with the candlestick you know this is uh, modern socially realistic crime fiction so i knew that i was in for the typical karen slaughter experience but my first reaction was just one of such happiness and delight and joy to be back with those characters and i would mm -hmm. want her to you know, as a reader and a writer, explain that to me, Karen. I mean, how is it that we can, we just love these people. Will Trent, I love him. Uh, Sarah, Faith, these are like friends of mine. How does that work? Um, I wish I knew because it must be said the 140 million, you're doing a lot of heavy lifting on that number of books sold. Uh, so you are pretty damn good at writing one character people love. Um, you know, I, I just really have grown up with Sarah. I mean, hopefully you'll agree because you've known me as long as I've been writing her that I, I haven't changed fundamentally who I am, but I think as you get older, you look at things differently. And Sarah, when she first started out in Blindsided was very black and white about what's right and wrong. And as she's progressed through the different series and she's experienced loss and love and you know, seen some really horrific things, thanks to me, I think that she's really embracing the gray parts of life. And that only happens, unfortunately, as you get older. I'll never do, I'll do a lot of bad things for her, to her, but I won't allow her to get as old as I am. Um, but, you know, she does have a, a different way of looking at things. And her relationship with Will is something I love because they're two people who really like each other. And it's really difficult. I mean, Lee, you, you had the perfect paradigm because Reacher's never gonna settle down and get married and stay in one place. So it's really hard to write people who are happy together um, because there, you have to find ways to put them in tension that aren't, they're going to break up, they're going to make up, they're going to break up, they're going to make up. Um, and so it's really difficult to do that. And fortunately, every time I write about them, something really horrific happens that brings them closer together. Um, and that with After That Night was something that happened that was very personal to Sarah. Um, and we should say that maybe you like Will because Will is physically a little bit based on you, Lee because I had written about a character who had dark hair and I wanted to write about a new male character. And I thought, well, I can't, he can't have the same description as the last one. But I was really worried because I know a lot of men with light colored hair who go bald. And so I didn't want to do that to Will. And I looked at Lee and I thought, okay, he's still got a full head of hair. So I think I'm safe making 
my character have the same color hair as, as my friend Lee. Well, that's why I love Will so much, because my private theory is he's totally based on me. Uh, you know, tall, physically awkward, um, not elegant, uh, moving around, uh, odd. Uh, I don't share the same kind of um, disability that Will has, but I have others. And I, I, I thought, yeah, you, you just wrote me there. And so in a way, I like to see what I'm doing in the new story. Well, that was why it was a joy. To, oh, I'm sorry. That was that was why no, no, it was please. a joy for them to, to meet each other when we wrote "Cleaning the Gold" because I I thought Lee's actually meeting himself. Yeah, I'd love to learn that actually, and that story is running and running. It seems to keep selling. Have you, Lee? Have you found yourself uh, writing Karen into one of your books, or using uh, as an inspiration or a model for for, for one of your characters? You know, I'm not going to reveal that because, uh, yeah, to us, to us, because for me, it's about, you know, you write the, you're writing a book, you're sitting there for six months, essentially, with Reacher is obviously a constant, but all the other characters in a Reacher story are, are invented for that story and will only last for that story. So, especially the woman. You know, I'm sitting there for six months with a made up woman. Of course, I'm going to make her interesting, cute, uh, attractive, the sort of woman that Reacher would respond to. And so, yeah, there is, uh, there's a lot of Karen actually in a couple of the characters because she is that, uh, you know, writer world is a strange, strange thing because we are, we are on our own almost all the time. Uh, you know, you work alone. And so the definition of a close friendship in writer world is somebody that you see maybe three or four times a year. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, Karen and I are, are close friends in that sense. We were just in New York together uh, last week or the week before or whenever it was. And we have dinner. We, have, we went to the theater and so on. And to me, that counts as a real close friendship. I might not see her for months, but uh, we mm. will pick up exactly where we left off. And to me, that is always the, the hallmark of a true friendship that you, you don't have to reintroduce yourself. You, you, yeah. you reply to something that was said three months ago, and it makes total sense. But presumably you don't discuss your work, your ongoing book, as you're writing it. I mean, you, you, you keep your friendship very discreet in that sense, or, or separate, I should say. You don't phone up Karen and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm struggling a bit with this character. What should I do? Or do you phone up Lee and say, oh, where do I go with this? I, you know, I don't I'm think too, struggles. I'm too <laughs> proud and too arrogant to admit to us. You know, at heart, I'm British. You know, never let them see you sweat. And so Absolutely. I would never, I would never reveal a weakness to anybody. But uh, and and there's no point in, in in phoning Karen when she's writing because she tends to go away to a, a remote location that uh, you could never find. You, you would need a Navy SEAL team to find it, and I'm sure it does not have communications. And so uh, she has a, generally speaking, a, people who leave a pot pie outside the door. Uh, they don't disturb her, and I'm certainly not going to disturb her because if you read her books, you don't want to get on the wrong side of Karen Slaughter. <laughs> it's interesting, Karen, what you were saying earlier on about about the development of your characters, how they have to how they have to change. And it, it, you anticipated a, a question I wanted to ask about the value of a series of having sequential books, one after the other, where you're exploring that. What's the what what is the true value of having that? Is it is it is it that it becomes, and I hate to use the word of a franchise or or, or a brand, uh, but do do you think readers like to have that? I want to know what's going to happen in the next Reacher book. I want to know what's going to happen in the next Karen Slaughter book. Is is it is, does that give a hook for readers to hang on to? Do you think is that is that an attractive proposition for readers? I think so, and you know. It, here's the funny thing about what Lee does so well is you know what's going to happen in the next Reacher book. Reacher's going to get off a bus or out of a car in a weird town in America, and there's going to be some bad stuff going on, and he's going to straighten it out and probably shoot a bunch of people in the kneecaps. And 
every single, I don't know how he does it every single time. It, he makes it so interesting and Reacher doesn't really change. You know, he never, there's never an opening scene where he's sitting on a park bench, staring at his navel saying, why do I kill so many people? You know, why do I have to be the superhero? Why can't I just m meet a nice girl and settle down? I mean, he really is an American bond in that regard. Um, and I do the exact opposite. You know, my people are very connected. Um, they rely on each other. Part of that reason, I think, for Will specifically, is he was a man raised without a family, so he seeks out family situations. He's created that in his work. He's going to be with a woman who has really tight, tight family ties and talks to her sister every day. And her sister mm -hmm. has moved in downstairs and her parents are always there. And, you know, he's, he's been told repeatedly that this is normal, but it's still very strange to him. And I think readers do like getting back into that familiarity and, you know, oh, well, this is Tessa, how's Sarah's sister doing? And how is Faith's son doing and that sort of thing. So even though I do the exact opposite of what Will does and I have people who are deeply connected to each other, I do think they know when they start a book, they're going to feel that familiarity of things are going to be okay. And I think as much as we love scary, twisty, turny crime novels, the thing that brings us back again and again is this sense that justice will be done and that's one thing that Lee and I do exactly the same because you find out who did it and they, they very seldom are left to the justice system. There's always this sense that their, their comeuppance is going to be really something that's extra judicial and a really good punishment mm. for what they've done. Yeah, it's almost a sort of deus ex machina, isn't it? That, as you say, it's not that the justice system isn't going to deal with them. It, it needs to be some greater power metaphorically speaking, you know, whether it's Reacher or whatever that, 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 that's, that's going to deal with that. What does that say about the American justice system? Are, are, you, are you both of you in a way somewhat pessimistic about it or about its uh, abilities to, to, to actually mete out justice? Well, I think there are, there are two points about that, that the, the, the comeuppance in the final chapter usually is a metaphor in itself. Uh, you know, we're civilized people and we are writing for civilized people in as much as readers as a whole are more thoughtful, more educated, uh, wider horizons than non-readers. So there's a, there's a specific character, uh, category of people that, that, that we're entertaining who completely understand that you shouldn't do what Reacher does. Uh, this is they, they don't take it as a textbook for how to live or for how things ought to be, but it's essentially a metaphor for the closure. Um, that's what readers crave. They they want to see a bad person punished, and in the real world, sure, it can go to trial. But then we'd have to write two thrillers. We'd have to write the the chase thriller, the investigation part. That's one book. Then we'd have to write the legal thriller showing them on trial. So really, as a way of collapsing that chronology, the final chapter is, is usually the bad guy gets the comeuppance from Reacher or from uh, Will or whoever, um, because that is emotionally satisfying to the reader. But don't think that the reader approves of that deep down. The reader takes it as a consolation because real life legal procedure is often very technical, very drawn out, sometimes unsatisfactory. In general, I think the US legal system is in uh, a huge mess, but probably no more of a mess than most other countries. It has some distinct mm -hmm. features that make it very difficult, but legal systems everywhere are under tremendous strain. And I, I certainly wouldn't say the US one is poster boy for the world, but it is, probably not significantly worse than than most countries. It's interesting what you say about the fact that your readers wouldn't necessarily approve or see this see uh, Reach's behavior as, as, as a model for themselves. But there is undoubtedly a sense of sort of uh, uh, joy when <laughs> when he does administer the final bullet or the you know, I, I mean, you, you can hear the readers across the world cheering that that's the case. 
Very much so, and that, that is because sophisticated people understand that uh, fiction is different than real life, uh, and that real life is, is drawn out and tedious, and they just love that dopamine hit of instant justice. But I, I do believe that they, they're under no illusion that this is made up and that the real world must work differently. I'm interested in, in the, the kind of the violence quota in, 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 in both of your books, and I love them. Uh, and, and I get that dopamine factor uh, myself. But why do you think people like that? And Karen, why, what, 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 what was your impulse to write the violence that you write in your books? Uh, some people might have said, well, it's, a, it's kind of an unusual thing for a, for a woman writer to, to be writing about. And, and you've said in the past that when you're asked that question, you say, well, nobody asked Lee that question. Why are you asking me that question? Uh, but the violence, particularly in, 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 in this new book here, uh, is very graphic and very, very painful. Um, what, do you, what do you want your reader to get from that? Well, I, you know, I do think it's true. Lee kills uh, and maims and uh, hurts a, an awful lot of people in his books and no one says it's too violent. Um, and I, I think that's because you don't feel the violence the way when I write about it. And for the most part, I think Reacher is taking out people you really want to see get hurt. Um, I mean, there's a reason why we're all rooting for the orcas right now that are tearing these boats apart. Um, and so for me, you know, when I write a, a particular scene, I, I, I take a more realistic approach, I believe. I mean, we all want to be Jack Reacher, but at the end of the day, he would be in prison for the rest of his life, probably. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in what I'm doing, you know, I do want to take it to a very personal level. And where mm -hmm. I think some stories are more about punishment, mine is about this is what happens. This is what it looks like. And it's a very personal thing for me because when I was growing up, my grandmother was being horrifically abused by my grandfather. And we just ignored right. it as a family. And it, when I was very little, I thought she was clumsy because that's what they would say if she had a black eye or a broken bone. Oh, you know, clumsy grandma. And as I got older, and figured it out, I asked my sister and she said, we don't talk about that. And as I look mm. back, I realized that silence only protected him. And so when I started writing, and I didn't talk about this very much because I felt a bit of shame about not somehow being the smartest kid in the world and figuring this out and standing up for her while she was alive, which is a lot of expectation to put on a child. Um, but I, I wanted to tell the story honestly and accurately. A lot of books at the time were glamorizing assault, making rape titillating. We still see that a little bit in popular fiction where rape is a device of, you know, some sort of sexual extremism and it's okay because in the end she really wanted it or she deserved it or whatever. Um, and so I wanted to write realistically about what it looks like and not just that, but how it reverberates through families, communities, investigators, pastors, you know, people a woman works with or a man, because rape can also happen to men. But specifically with Sarah's story, it's called After That Night, because after what happened to her, everything changed. And how she navigated her life changed, because there's always that question I've got this new friend, I've got this new love interest, I've got this new person in my life. Do I tell them what happened to me? And not that she's ashamed of it, but how do I manage their feelings around this? Because everyone has a different reaction to it. And it's so it, it's just that the kind of crime where the violation is continual. And I think it's important to tell that part of the story too. I mean, it's it's both both of your your books are very uh, very researched, very research led. I mean, when Reacher reaches for a weapon, or we know that you you know what that weapon does. Uh, here, uh, when you're describing Sarah Linton as a medic, I mean, I read that and I, and I thought, God, you you could almost perform a medical operation yourself, Karen. You seem to know the the procedure so well. I don't know how that would go, but anyway, that, that's the sense I get. 
in 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 this new book i mean what were you, were you talking to rape victims did you talk to rape victims did you sort of explore that side of things or does this all come out of your imagination well it's a little both um i every woman i know knows a woman who has experienced something like this if not actual assault i mean i remember very clearly the first time I had a really creepy friend of my father's when I was 12 make a comment about my body developing. And it's just something that every woman uh, has had happen to them and lives with. So I, I didn't have to do a, a lot of research in that regard. I did talk, talk to um, trauma counselors. I talked to police officers. You know, I talked to some police officers who think rape is not a crime that happens still in this day and age, you know, they talk about how very rare it is. And, you know, even though statistically that doesn't bear out at all. Um, and I just thought it was really important to make sure I had all my statistics and all my ducks in a row. And I have a friend who is a, a medical doctor who's been advising me on things that make Sarah look like she knows what she's doing since the second novel, um, because I, I don't want to get letters from doctors saying, this is not how you do it. So I think they appreciate that I try to make it as accurate as possible. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna speak for Lee, but in the United States, if you write a book that has one small detail incorrect about a gun, people will haunt you until the day you die. So I'm pretty sure your research is maybe interest and in, in part fear-based because of the people out there who will write you those nasty letters. Is that true, Lee? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> but you cannot win uh, either because it doesn't really matter what is true or real. It only matters what is the opinion of the person writing to you. And what, <clears throat> what I do about research is I'm very conscious that the schedule on which we work, typically a book a year, um, means that there really isn't much time for thinking about the research. There's time to do it, but you've got to let it settle. You've got to let it percolate. Uh, you've got to do the iceberg thing where 10% of it is really significant and 90% of it can be uh, ditched, but you don't know that yet. So what I try and do is rely on what I've already found out uh, uh, in an organic process over many years. Um, but I will pick up little bits and pieces. For instance, I once had dinner with uh, an ex-SAS soldier who had, um, when he mustered out of the army, he was then the highest decorated soldier from the British Army at the time. And he had been on SAS missions that are the, exactly the kind of things that we make up. Uh, I mean, really serious stuff. And um, in passing, just in conversation, he, he mentioned that he, he didn't care what weapon he was issued with. It was just a tool. He was like a carpenter coming to fix your house. He didn't really care what kind of hammer they gave him. The only rule he had was that he would not use a weapon that had been loaded for a long time, an automatic weapon that had been loaded for a long time, because he worried that the spring in the magazine would have lost its temper and therefore the second round would not load. He wanted a fresh magazine with a new spring and he would load it himself. That was his only stipulation. And I thought, fantastic. I've got the most decorated um, soldier from the British army giving me this little piece of inside information. So that went straight into the next book. And I, I got 10,000 emails, most of them from Texas saying, Oh, my granddaddy's got a gun that's been loaded for 75 years and it works just fine. And so even when you're right, you're wrong. And some of the things that you get criticized for, you've done deliberately wrong because, right. um, you know, I, I did a novel um, set in New York City where I was living and uh, love, just love New York. And I know New York so well, like the back of my hand. And so... I had people driving according to reality. Uh, you know, th some places you can't turn left, some places you can't do a U-turn, all this kind of thing. And I was instinctively incorporating that as I wrote it. And then I reread the section and I thought, this is crazy. It reads like a 
page for MapQuest or something um, on Asset. We've got to get rid of this. So I just simplified it, doing it in ways that uh, that matched the geography of Manhattan, which everybody knows basically, but ignored all the traffic regulations. And it made it a much better book, uh, even though it was not accurate. Karen, you, you, you've described yourself as a, as a social, 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 socially conscious storytelling, uh, and you alluded to that earlier on. And one thing that strikes me uh, in, in this new book is it really does explore the worst possible of men's attitudes to women. It's, it's very, and you, you mentioned incels. Do we think that the, the relationship between the sexes is deteriorating? Do you think this is a bad time for relationships between men and women? No, because I, you know, it's a handful of guys. It's always a handful of guys through history. And sometimes they're called incels and sometimes they're called clan, white supremacists. You know, it's weird that white supremacists are never feminist. Um, and it, it's just a, a, a certain percentage. But it is very dangerous to be a woman because you can't really suss that out quickly. So I think it's good that we have the internet because men who are, feel that way are out there saying these things and organizing and, you know, usually they have a little blue check next to their name so we know who they are. Um, but it, it it's not anything new at all. We've experienced this from the beginning of time. Um, mm -hmm. And I write about some really great men, uh, Will Trent, uh, Sarah's yeah, father, yeah. Eddie Linton, um, you know, Jeremy Faith's uh, son. And, but I, you know, I never ever get credit for writing about really terrible women. And there's a, a really nasty woman in this book uh, who is the type of woman every woman knows. She, I think she's called a pick me, where she'll say, oh, I don't have many women friends, women annoy me. And you just think, well, women don't like you. That's why you don't have many women <laughs> friends. Um, so, I mean, there are very, a lot of fraught complications um, between men and women that, that have existed for a while. But, I mean, I guess the, the fact that we still see families, we still see marriages, we still see people together and friendships and that sort of thing kind of puts that to the lie. I think most people get along well and most people you know, the women I know really love their husbands and their husbands really love them. And it's very respectful. And that's kind of what I try to write with Will and Sarah is that kind of relationship where sure. he does the sexiest thing a man can do, which is listen to a woman. Um, it's, it's why I love Reacher. I mean, Lee, you probably wouldn't disagree with me saying that you also have a social conscience when you write. And Reacher says something that is just music to a woman's ear. Sometimes he'll say to the female character, you're right, let's do it your way. Uh, and of course she gives him a, a romping good time in bed after that. I mean, it's uh, it's part of the, the Reacher paradigm that he's this big Mr. Macho guy, but he's, I think the thing that makes him so sexy is that he listens to women. I try what? to, uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I grew up in a particular generation that went through this whole thing. I mean, I was born in um, the first half of the 1950s. And you would have to say that uh, gender relationships then were awful and um, race relations then were awful. Uh, but during my lifetime, it's gotten a, a whole lot better. And um, but what I love about Karen's stuff is that she is very honest about it, um, that there are little cliques of men who are smug and complacent and dismissive of women, of course, but also of other men, um, poorer people, uh, less advantaged people. There's this little coterie of, of self-assured smugness that is so annoying and uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Risha would to totally take against that. But I try and make Risha a kind of post everything. He's a very rational guy. And so he looks at the question, are women the equal of men? And his rational answer is yes, what's next? You know, that's all he, all he needs to know. So he will absolutely mm -hmm. listen, but he'll also kill him 
if necessary. If, if they're the perpetrator, then they don't get a, a, any breaks out of that. Uh, he's an equal opportunity friend and an equal opportunity enemy. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to him who you are. Do you, do you have an idea, both of you, about how your readership breaks down in terms of in terms of gender? Do you, do you Karen, do you, do you do you have many, many more women readers than men and vice versa? Lee, how, how does that break down? And, and if, if so, does that rather aggravate you? Would you like Lee, would you like to have more women readers? Karen, would you like to have more men readers? I think Lee and I would both like to have all the readers in the entire world, no matter what. Um, very modest uh, aspiration. <laughs> yes, but just, just in fiction, I'm more women by fiction than men by far. I think it's anywhere from 80 to 85% of women are the book buyers. And so my readers break down along those lines. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll have an event and that's clearly reflected. Um, and I think that 15% are some really sexy, interesting guys to be there. I will have someone say to me occasionally, oh, I don't read books written by women, uh, which is a, a crazy thing to say. It's one of the few things you can say and get away with, and people don't really question that. Um, it's kind of like saying, I hate cats. People are like, okay, uh, when I would say, well, you're a psychopath if you don't like cats. Um, but right. it, it is, a, I think, a, a, a a good mixture of people. I don't know, Lee, do you, is yours more heavily male or? You know, I don't think it is, but echoing what you just said, yeah, I, I remember once having a crazy dream, literally a dream. I was asleep and had this dream and somebody like Mick uh, was interviewing me for a newspaper and he said, your last book sold four billion copies. That's half the world's population. How does that make you feel? And I said, what's wrong with the other half? You know, <laughs> you can never have too many readers. And I, I think my readership, all, all fiction is mostly women or majority women. You know, I think any, any fiction title is probably 60% women. And uh, I think I've got slightly more than my share. I've probably got 65. I mean, a lot of guys read, read them, of course, but the women are the passionate fans and men have such a strange relationship with admiring something else. Uh, I've, I found that so noticeable and so geographic as well. I remember doing uh, a bookstore event in Washington, DC and well attended. There were probably, I don't know, 65% women, 35% men, packed store. But the men all hung, out, hung around at the back. And then when the questions question and answer started, it was a problem for them because they had a kind of feeling that they, if they were going to ask a question, they would have to preface it by saying, I love your books, or something about the question would involve admiration of the books, and they wouldn't do it. As soon as it hit the Q&A, all these guys at the back just slunk away. Um, so, yeah, the <laughs> men readers are, it's, it's a proposition that drives us crazy, really, especially hmm. what, what, what you call AB1 males who are literate. They have the money to buy the books, but they won't. They buy nonfiction instead. And as a theoretical thing, um, I was going to say even, at our level, but I think especially at our level, thrillers and crime are really the last socially realistic novels that we have. And they teach you an awful lot about the world and people. And yet AB1 men would rather read about a president who died 200 years ago than something that it matters today. And it drives us nuts. No, that's a really, that's a really interesting point because there is this sort of snobbery, isn't there, about, about thrillers they're not regarded as literary works of art um, and this somehow diminishes them uh, but th what gives the light to that of course is the fact that well millions of people read them <laughs> and they, they 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 reach audiences that literary uh, literary novels simply don't do yeah that's und undeniably true uh, that um, 
you know, that it's the currency of the world. Uh, popular fiction is what is consumed and therefore it is the main channel for carrying opinion. And uh, I, in, in no way do I think anybody's going to read my books in a hundred years. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they referred to Karen's in a hundred years because her books carry reality. This is what happens in, uh, it, in, in parts of America. Uh, this is how it happens. This is how it feels. All of, those, all of that information is not really recorded anywhere else. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if the body of crime fiction that's being produced now will carry forward. And it does actually fascinate me on a separate level that if you look at the history of uh, crime fiction or thrillers or whatever you want to call them, they started out with like really ludicrous plots, um, you know, like uh, Poe's story, The Rue Morgue. It was the orangutan that did it. And you read Sherlock Holmes and somebody's murdered because somebody let a snake coil itself down a bell, push rope and bite the guy and then it went back up again. It, stri it strikes me that rationally, we should have used up all the sensible plots first and now we should be reduced to ludicrous plots because they've all gone, but it's happened the other way around. <laughs> so we're not going to see an orangutan in, in your next book, but actually you raise a very interesting point about, about uh, the, the books you write are telling the story of the way the world is now. I mentioned uh, A Tale of Two Cities at the beginning of this. Uh, perhaps Karen, your, the, the books you're writing are t today's A Tale of Two Cities, that you're, you're, you are the Charles Dickens of our day. Well, I, don't, I would That's sound like question. such an asshole if I said it. I think probably maybe Lee will agree in a hundred years, Stephen King will definitely, I mean, he's, he's amazing at crafting characters. Um, I, I d disagree with Lee about Reacher because we still have so many uh, James Bond. I mean, it's just kind of taken on a life of its own. So every, I think every generation finds or refines literature from the past and and so I wouldn't dismiss it that quickly. I, I do think that crime fiction written a certain way holds a mirror up to society. And I would say that Dickens wrote about criminals and crime. Uh, and we have a tendency in the modern world to say, okay, well, if I'm really smart and I'm enjoying Margaret Atwood, that's not dystopia, that's literature. Uh, if I'm enjoying Lee Child, that's not a thriller. You know, that's something else. We it, A lot of really smart people get annoyed when you say, hey, The Great Gatsby, that's a crime story. Or, you know, any number of stories that we talk about today have some element of crime. So I do think it's a universal fear that crime will happen to us. I think that that desire to see justice is something that's hardwired into us. Um, one of the, the first crime novelists in America, you know, Lee mentioned Poe, he was, wrote the first short story, but a woman wrote what's considered the first crime novel, and it was called The Dead Letter, about a letter that was mailed and it couldn't be delivered and it ended up in the post office, and that's what they call a dead letter, and it was called a domestic okay. thriller. Uh, so one of the right. very first ones by Meta Fuller Victor, and it just kind of got lost and rediscovered and lost and rediscovered. And I mean, that's the joy of being a reader is finding these new books that maybe had been forgotten about or not really uh, in favor for a while and refinding them. Interesting point uh, about Dickens, though, that, uh, you know, Dickens was super popular early to mid 19th century, huge, huge author. And then there was a kind of uh, backlash um, not long after that, where people criticized him just for pandering to, to uh, what the mass audience was interested in. And then there was a, mm. a kind of other back backlash where he was then rehabilitated. And around the turn of the 20th century, G.K. Chesterton wrote a biography of Dickens in which he argued that Dickens did not write what the audience wanted. Dickens wanted what the audience wanted. And I think mm. that that is very much what Karen is saying, that we as individuals get outraged by unfairness, 
injustice and we want to put it right. And that is a fellow feeling with millions and millions of other people. That's a very basic human condition. People, even in this awful, uh, confused, toxic, cynical world that we're in, most people, most of the time, want to do the decent thing. And they really respond in a book where the decent thing is done after 400 pages of intense excitement. Mm. That's a very, very good point. Um, I, I'm going to turn to some uh, some, some, some questions. Uh, we don't have an audience uh, here with us uh, this evening at the moment, but I've got these questions that have been submitted. Uh, a Telegraph subscriber called Amy asks, what advice can both of you give to aspiring readers? Writers, I should say. <laughs> what advice would well, you I give to aspiring writers? I think we'll probably duplicate each other, right? Just sit down and write. That's the hardest part is putting your butt in the chair. Because uh, I think everybody has at least one terrific idea for a book. Uh, and that's really not the hard part. It's sitting down, figuring out how to express it through character. How am I going to keep the suspense? How am I going to keep them turning the pages? Where's the tension coming from? Figuring out all those little nuts and bolts of a story and how it works, that, that's where you become a writer. Mm. Yeah, my answer would be two sort of short things. Number one, like Karen said, don't get it right, get it written. Uh, that is the fundamental thing. You, if you write a book and it's not perfect, you can fix it. If you've got 400 blank pages, there's nothing you can do with that. And the other thing I would say is, to Amy is ignore my advice, ignore Karen's advice. The only way a book can work is if it is the living, breathing product of one imagination that has to be yours. Um, it, it, even if you're sure it's wrong, even if you're sure everybody's gonna hate it, do it your way because that's all you've got. That's all you can offer is your take. And so if you make sure that it is exactly what you want, that is success right there. And it does stand a chance because everybody, of course, is a unique individual, but not all that unique. Um, there are thousands of people pretty similar to you. And so if you've written a book that totally satisfies yourself with no compromise, it will find an audience. If on the other hand, you think, oh, well, I really want to do this but Karen Slaughter doesn't do that. And Lee Child does it later in the book. So what should I do? If you start thinking along those lines, you're lost. It has to be your product. And so mm -hmm. it's not flippant to say, ignore all advice. It, it's, it's actually essential. Right. Yeah, so don't think in advance about how is this going to be received? Uh, is this going to sell a million copies? Uh, you know, just. And, and the, the first the first word is the hardest, basically, isn't it? In doing in, as it is, the first step of journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You know that that's what you've got to do. You've just got to commit to the page. I remember with the first book, yeah, the first word is super intimidating because you know that you're leaping into the unknown. Then subsequently, the first line, the first paragraph, is, has always been my favourite part. Because uh, the first line in a book is unique. It's the only line that doesn't follow another line. So it can be anything at all. And I just love that feeling of possibility. You sit down, you write that first sentence. It can go anywhere from there. I mean, in any endeavor, the world cautions us to, you know, if, if you get knocked down, get up again. Uh, have you had to face the terror of rejection slips? Have you have either of you ever had a rejection slip? Well, I certainly have. Um, Lee and I had s similar circumstances because we had just experienced a, a loss in our livelihood um, and decided now's the time to buckle down and write that book. Um, and I I think that having that that fire under you uh and having a finite amount of time to do something is had was really refreshing for me because it's it was a now or never sort of thing and i jumped right into it and i think feeling like there was no safety net gave me the ability to take risk that i wouldn't otherwise risk and to get into actually being doing the work of being a writer as opposed to talking about how i wanted to be a writer 
Right. How do you feel yeah, about I mean, the... I, sorry. Oh. Yeah, crucial point there for both of us. We had no choice. Uh, it, you know, it was either sell a book or starve. And so that makes a big difference. And I do admire people that can do it as a, as a hobby alongside a day job and then achieve success. I admire that. I don't know how that's possible because I needed that extra margin of pure desperation. Uh, you know, no alternative. This had to work. And I think that is a, is a factor that, that adds a lot. Hmm. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about you. You, you mentioned the, uh, the alluded to the adaptations and, and, the, and the, the, the fact that um, streaming has, has brought a whole new dimension to, to your work. How, how do you feel about the the treatment that your your books have received in film and on television? Are you do you see that as a very collaborative process, or are you happy to hand them over to Netflix or the production company or whomever it may be and, and, and step back? I mean, do you feel like it's your child that's been taken away from you and you need to be very protective of it? I'll let Karen answer that one first. <laughs> I was waiting for you. You know, I think if you don't want it to be adapted, there's this great thing you can do, which is say no. And that you should be prepared for what might happen. And I, I say that as someone who has been very fortunate. I'm very happy with what happened uh, with both pieces of her and with the Will Trent series. Um, and I, I will say, you know, the first thing a lot of people will say was he he doesn't look like Will Trent, Ramon Rodriguez, who plays Will Trent. You know, he's not he doesn't look like Lee Child. He's a, an American born in Puerto Rico. And um, it's still very, very sexy, it must be said. But he physically doesn't look like Lee, but he gets uh, Lee will. He gets what the character is. And he's really put the work in to understand that. And so I just had to tell myself that they're going to look different, but as long as the spirit of the work is there, that's what's important to me, because I feel like I'm the gatekeeper of these stories for my readers. Mm -hmm. But that being said, the book is the book, the show is the show. And if you don't like the show, right. the books are always there. And if you don't like the books, which I don't know what's wrong with you if you don't, but you can still watch the show and enjoy it. Do you go on set do you, or, or, or do you prefer to keep away from the set? Do you like to go I on and sort of? I like it. I, I don't. I don't want to be there forever. I certainly don't have the poise that Lee does mm -hmm. because he was in a very what felt like a very long scene in one of the Jack Reacher movies. I was in pieces of her for two seconds, and I had to walk by the camera, and I had to carry a purse, which I don't normally do. So first, I had to figure out how do I carry this purse and look like a normal person. And I was so self-conscious the entire time. And it's only a few seconds on film. And that's probably the last time I'll do that. It was just, I, I, I forgot how to walk. It was that stressful. Uh, but <laughs> I, I think you did a really fantastic job in yours because you just look like yourself. I have well, to say, I, I thought, sorry, Lee, go ahead. I, I, I was sort of just going to echo what Karen said. I mean, the fundamental choice is, uh, do you sell it or not? And that is absolutely your choice. And I know numerous writers who prefer not to. Uh, but it, And then if you do sell it, it's in the lap of the gods. And generally speaking, nobody will buy it to make unless they love it. Uh, you know, there's no reason to do it otherwise. So that in my case, for both the feature films and the streaming television, it was done by people who were fans. They loved the series. They wanted to do right by it. And then it becomes a bit like a situation I've been in and probably Karen's been in too. You're just randomly eating in a restaurant somewhere and somebody at the next table is talking about your books. And I eavesdrop on that and I, I'm listening to their opinion and it's fascinating. And really that's all that a film or TV is. It's somebody's opinion of, of the book. And as long as it's done with goodwill, wholeheartedly, um, with good craft, it really can't go wrong because there's a love behind it. They're doing this because they love the property. So there's, there's very little danger in it really. Uh, in my case, I felt, um, you know, historically, 
nobody would have done a feature film deal if streaming television had been around at the time because it just fits so much better. So I, I am much happier with the um, Amazon Prime series than I was with the feature films. And everybody assumes that's because I thought Tom Cruise was no good and so on. I actually loved Tom Cruise as a person, as a man, as a human being, as an actor. I thought he's the loveliest guy and he did a, he did a really great job uh, on the feature films. But what I love about the streaming series is the endless running time. You can actually tell the story in a bit like you write a novel with periods of light and shade, slow and fast, little diversions. There's time for that and that makes a huge difference. I get you, you're, you're preempting a question uh, that I was going to ask from Suzanne, uh, and I think the answer is probably going to be no. Will there be any further Jack Reacher films? Well, you just explained you, you, there's no need for a, a Jack Reacher film because the, the streaming series is doing doing the work for it. Yeah, exactly. I think that, uh, you know, the, the feature film deal was done in 2005, which is now almost 20 years ago. And if I was Thinking about it now, of course, I would not do feature films simply, as I say, because of that, the luxury of the running time is something that is ir irresistible. So, yeah, I think we'll be looking at television for the future rather than than movies. So what are you both doing at the moment? I mean, are you are you working on new books or are you in a period of sort of hiatus? I'm talking about them, obviously, and promoting them, uh, but looking forward to actually getting back to your bunker or your desk or wherever it is that you you write the, the meal outside the door, Karen, that you, you you're, you're going to be eating. Uh, do you have new books planned or, or is that in the future sometime? I have I definitely have them planned. I'm I'm one of these types of writers who really annoys other writers because I'll be working on one book and I'll get an idea for the next one in the next one. And that really seems to, to be my process from the very beginning. I've been able to do that. And it's great when you're writing series because you can put little hints about what's to come in every single book. Um, and so I'm working on the next Will and Sarah novel. I think the next one after that's going to be a standalone. Uh, but the thing is, I am still extremely passionate about writing. I love it. Even when it's a bad day writing, it, it it beats um, being unemployed. Um, and, you know, I really am excited every time I start a new book. I want to try to find something new and different um, and shocking to say and that will keep my readers up at night and keep them talking at restaurants. Though I never go to restaurants, so I can't overhear anything. I'm at least much more cosmopolitan than me. I'm usually in my pajamas by 10 o'clock. Um, but I, that's what. I love, and that's that's kind of what why I do this still. I mean, it's still a really big part of me to sit down and be alone and tell those stories. So hopefully, I'll keep doing it for a really long time. Lee, I get I get the sense that you're. I mean, you're now working with your brother uh, Andrew. I mean, are we in a period of transition? Are you are you gradually winding down to the to, to the point where you hand it over completely, and then you just back out? Yeah, that's the process that we're, we're just coming up to the end of that transition period. And uh, I'm mm. just stepping back and uh, with a little pang of regret, uh, you know, hearing what Karen just said, uh, because I love the writing too. Uh, but there were two things that got in the way for me. One was that, uh, I mean, just two, two early life decisions that are now coming back to bite me. Um, as a reader, I was always so annoyed at long-term writers who got bored or ran out of gas or started phoning it in. And uh, there are so many examples of that, series that are magnificent for four or six or eight books, and then they fall off a cliff. Uh, I promised myself I would never do that. And I, I think I was a little hyper alert about it because the last one that I did on my own that feeling of sitting down, loving what you're doing, I'm, that went wrong a couple of days. And I remember twice thinking, uh, I really don't want to be doing this. And so I took that as like an early warning 
alert. Uh, you know, you're going to turn into the kind of author you hate uh, if you carry on like this. So I was very, uh, it was a bit of a hair trigger decision to, as soon as I detected that danger sign to stop. And the other thing was that as a young person, I remember being so aggrieved at the way older people just hung around. They would not get off the stage. They would not give us a chance. And so I've, you know, rigidly, I suppose, I've tried to stick to that feeling that, you know, I had a great, great, great run of success and luck and uh, enjoyment. A quarter century, I, I, I got away with it. it, was fantastic. But now let's let the younger generation do it because, and I'm, I know Karen agrees with this because we're both very involved with, with new authors. Um, there's so much passion, so much energy, so many ideas coming from the, the new generation. Uh, I just thought I should make some space for them. Well, I think all, all the Telegraph subscribers who are watching this and all, all your readership uh, would join me in, in, in saying thank you for what you have done over the last 25 years. And, and it's been a fantastic ride. Uh, and Karen, we've still got more of that fantastic ride to come from you, and, and we all look forward to that. It just remains for me to say thank you very much indeed for your work and, and for your time this evening. And it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Uh, so thank you. Um, if you haven't already, do go out and buy both Karen's After That Night and Lee's No Plan B from all good retailers, including Telegraph Bookshop. And our next book club is on the 12th of July with Kate Moss to discuss her new book, The Ghost Ship. So do remember to book your free tickets to that. But again, to both of you, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.